those of you who got an invite, welcome to Nerd Prom. <laughs> no matter where in the world you are, we're all Nerds International with the hyphen. Welcome to Veiled Fury Entertainment. I'm Manu and I'm going to be your host for the night today. Whenever you're getting around to actually watching this because this is not streamed live as I usually do. This is pre-recorded. I have with me the one, the only, the Don, Eric Lamoureux. Hi Eric, thank you for being here. Hi, thanks for having me. It's uh, like I was telling you, that I really appreciate that and come on your show finally great <laughs> honor so hi everybody yeah well i i've had a lot of the the other folks here for actual plays i haven't had gary here need to get him on the show sometime as well mm. maybe no you don't <laughs> <laughs> yeah maybe maybe not <laughs> well um you are here to talk about uh about the mafia and and all of that so but before we get into the juicy bits of all the nice uh, things you are work, working on in that regards some people who are watching this may not actually know you from where i know you and how i got to know you so who are you and what do you do when you're not designing rpgs and settings all right well my name is eric lamaru uh, originally from montreal canada and I moved down here in the States in Pennsylvania for uh, 15 years ago. It's good. Yeah, it's going to be 15 years uh, next month. So, and I moved here because of my wife. I uh, met my wife and she was from here. So it was easier for me to move down here. Um, uh, you may know me from the Wild Eye podcast where I've been a co-host since... Well, almost the beginning of the show, I I was invited by Jamie in 2015, uh, probably like episode five or something like that, and then the show was handed uh, handed over to me, and then I invited the rest of you clowns to on the show to be part of it. <laughs> uh, I also do a a uh, well a bit of freelancing. Uh, for Savage Worlds, um, I've I've written for probably six or seven different licensees, and also I'm I'm part of the team for Just Insert Imagination, where I've worked on uh, Winter Eternal, a uh, bunch of plug-in plays, uh, snap sites, and of course now uh, Wise Guys. So. That's basically it. I'm 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 the troll on social media that likes to <laughs> likes to get under people's skin. No, I mean I, I think I think I'm pretty visible, and uh, I, I like I like to meet people and get into conversation. So th this is great <laughs> <laughs> interview. Uh, I mean, as far as what I do when I don't do all that stuff, uh, mostly I sleep and I work my day job, which is. I'm a lab technician for quality control at a plastic molding company. So pretty boring, basically measuring parts, making sure they fit the requirements for the customers for new projects. And then they get approved or they get rejected and then I have to do it all over again. So <laughs> that's what I do for my day job. Sounds which, like, yeah, sounds like you've, got a, you've got a lot of time to, to think about stuff you, you want to do while working. Yeah, these days, yeah. I mean, it's well, it comes like for like now for three weeks. I haven't had a chance really to write, uh, write for wise guys at work. But there are weeks where, yeah, that's all I do all day long. I'm, not, I'm at a computer and type away and get some stuff done. <laughs> so now is probably the part where I should pixel your face and distort your voice so just in case any of your co-workers or your boss watch this they're like hey wait a second i'd be surprised but yeah <laughs> no it's all right yeah, <laughs> we're <know>. good <laughs> so uh the podcast did that happen before or after you actually started started creating stuff or was that just a case of one thing leading to the other uh, uh, freelancing happened before I started my first, 
uh, first work was in 2012 for Savage Insider. I wrote an article for them. Uh, totally terrible article. <laughs> it was pretty bad, but that was my first my first contribution. And then I went a couple of years uh, without doing anything. Um, and then, the, yeah, the podcast, I first started mid-2015. So it's been almost three years now since I've been doing this, which I didn't think I was made for that. And some people might, might argue that I'm still not. <laughs> I don't have a voice for that, but uh, I still enjoy it. I have a lot of fun doing it. So, yeah, it, it was freelancing first and then podcasting came later. Well, you certainly seem to manage us bag of cats all right. <laughs> so you must be doing something right. <laughs> yeah, the producing part. Yeah, I, I think. <laughs> I think that works out. I've I've learned a lot too about podcasting over the years. I mean, it's uh, like I say, I don't listen or watch a lot of podcasts, so I don't really have an idea of how to do it right. I just do it how I feel it should be done and how I would like to. I would like it done if I was to to listen or watch. Uh, this is how it would be and. But basically, it's it's just a bunch of friends talking and making it public, which is because I, I don't really think about the listeners all that much while we record a podcast. I just I just talk and then I, in the end, it ends up uh, being published. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the parts we, we don't cut out get published. And uh, if, if you've ever been a guest on the Wild Eye podcast, you you know, there's there's a lot that's being that's being cut. But yeah, that, yeah. That, happens, yeah, that happens when you when you put a bunch of guys together who really enjoy a particular a particular topic, a particular hobby. There's going to be banter and off topic, and I think you're managing that rather well, Ke keeping us kind of on track. I try. It's it's hard with Gary the Moose. He's he's hard to reel in, but. I mean, that's why I brought him in, too, because of his, his sense of humor. Uh, I think it, it adds a lot to the show. So uh, you, you have to let him lose, too. So same with Harrison. That's why I brought him in. So if I were to ask them to be all serious all of a sudden, it, it wouldn't work. But, yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess then we should probably get to the main subject and uh, I've got a lot of questions myself and uh, we have a lot of, of questions submitted by viewers of this show so uh, in no particular order I would like to thank uh, Harrison Hunt, Terry Hansen, Mike Morrison, Jeremy Steely or Sile, not sure and Richard Woolcock for contributing to this barrage of questions I'm about to unleash on Eric. <laughs> All right, hit me. <laughs> so, um, well, we're going to start with with a bit more of the past uh, because, as you already mentioned, you are part of the creative team that is known as just Insert Imagination, and with them or for them, as part of them, you made Forget About It and Bada Bing Bada Boom, which are two standalone adventures. But they also share the theme of Wise Guys, um, which <laughs> will now be a full-blown setting. So um, what made you pick this particular setting? What is your, your fascination with the Mafia? Well, uh, I mean, it goes back to my childhood, really. I remember when I was was a kid my on my dad's side... Um, they, they were quite older. I, my dad had me when he was like 36. So, and he was one of the youngest in his family. So it was hanging out with a bunch of, you know, late forties, 50 year olds. And they were from, you know, the, the fifties, that's where they were kids. So all the music we heard was uh, all crooners, uh, big bands, the, that type of music. And it, it, it sort of stuck with me. And then four years ago, my wife uh, took me to Las Vegas. That was my first trip. And we were at the Bellagio Fountain, which is like a great show, free show outside. And it was Frank Sinatra, uh, Luck Be a Lady, that played. And 
it just brought me back. It brought everything together. And then, of course, Vegas and the mob are uh, always been connected. And, um, yeah, my wife watched the movie Casino pretty much uh, once every week for a few years. (laughs) (laughs) So I'd happen to sit you know, sit on the, the movie, which at the time I didn't really get the, the whole mafia thing. But what, after Vegas, I think that's when it clicked and I started watching Casino and then Forget About It came, which was the first plug and play for Just Insert Imagination. Basically, it's got kind of like a one shot or con game kit um, or demo that you can take and then you know, when you don't have something to play one night, that type of thing. That was their concept behind it. And uh, and, th- and that was just from falling in love with, with the mafia, the, that fascination. And after that, we, we moved on to different projects, different plug and play, because for us, it was kind of an avenue to uh, get a feeling for what people wanted were interested in before just jumping in into a brand new setting to write. Plus at that time, that was over two years ago that it was released. Um, I consider myself still wet, (laughs) Uh, (laughs) not really, you know, writing adventures. I had written maybe uh, three adventures by then. So to me, a setting was really intimidating. And uh, so, yeah, that came out and then we've started working on different things, but people kept posting actual play reports of their forget about it game. And people were asking us, if if you make this into a setting, uh, take my money. So but <laughs> we were we were already working on something else. But meanwhile, I kept I just couldn't get it out of my head. I mean, it, it, I was always building it as a savage world setting in my head uh so for one year that went on in the meantime we released better bing better boom which is uh, a bigger adventure with a bit more setting rules investigative rules uh a set of expanded chase rules in there and the idea was to instead of making a setting just uh, making a series of smaller adventures that if you put them together uh, would basically be a setting or at least a toolbox, sandbox for you to play with. But like I said, I just couldn't get it out of my head and uh, asked Morning what he thought. And he was the one that pushed me because yet still I, I was a bit scared. It was intimidating writing a whole setting where before I, I'd write maybe four to you know, eight, 12 pages. So that was a bit more manageable, but, um, yeah, that's basically how it started. <laughs> With a dream, always mm-hmm. a dream. <laughs> now, I, I mean, if you want to know exactly what, what fascinates me about, uh, the mafia, I think looking at the show notes here and the rest of the questions, I, I think, I think you'll get it and and why it would be a good a, a good setting to play. <laughs> yeah, we are going to get to that. So um if you if you have been following Eric on on social media, then you will have noticed that he keeps us up to date on the research that he does. He posts movie recommendations, documentaries, interesting articles and uh, all of that gives a really interesting insight into the mind of the mob, if you will. So uh, if you go about your research that way, Eric, is do you just consume, consume, consume and see whatever s- just sticks to your mind? Or do you sit there with a notepad and just and, and write down the important bits? Okay, kind of all of the above. I mean, there was a bit, uh, I won't say a bit, it was a lot of front-loaded research because... To me, it was it was the movie Casino, the whole Vegas and, and the mafia and how everything fell apart. But after watching that, I, I still had a lot of questions like how how does skimming profits from a casino work? Um, 
how come there's no mob bosses in Vegas? Um, uh, how does it work? How does all of that work? Which by watching the movie, you get glimpses of it here and there. But I really wanted to get to the bottom of it and understand it. Because if I was going to write a setting about it, I needed to know that stuff. So uh, I started reading books. I read the, the book that inspired the movie Casino by a journalist. And then I, I read maybe four or five more books, uh, watched uh, thousands of, well, maybe not thousands, but <laughs> <laughs> hundreds of hours of uh, documentaries on YouTube, uh, watched all the movies, uh, all the mafia movies, except for Godfather. I, I didn't really watch these again. I mean, I've seen them probably 20, 25 years ago, but that's not something that I was interested in uh, for this because it's it's heavily heavily changed, uh, romanticized. Uh, in fact, I mean, on the set, there were there were mobsters on the set that would decide what could, what could be said, what could be revealed about the mafia and what couldn't. And if you pay attention, there's no mention of the word of the mafia in the movie. They, they call yeah. it the family. It's not the mafia. So, uh, but yeah, there, there was a lot of front loaded research about that. Of course, a lot of articles too. And so then once I had that, um, I, I could get some writing done, but then there was other research too. And yeah, well, when I research, uh, I always try to keep pen and paper with me. And I started what was supposed to be a bullet, a bullet journal, but I'm not very artistic. So, I mean, I, I tried a couple things like this, and then I tried uh, this here for interludes to write some like that and make it pretty. But as you can tell, I'm, I'm not all <laughs> that good. So it, it became more of a journal and a way to collect all my notes. So I've got a good hundred pages worth of notes here. Plus at some point I had all these papers in there in a little pocket. So uh, that, that's what I, because, uh, because you watch a movie or a documentary and then they say something important or it becomes a story seed for an adventure you want to write. So, um, sometimes you're like, oh man, this is so good. There's no way I'm going to forget it. And you don't write it, and then the next day you're like, well, "What is it I came up with while I was watching that movie yesterday?" And yeah. you can't remember it. So, um, yeah, I try to write everything down uh, if I can. If I don't have that book, usually at work there's a piece of paper, and I'll write it, put it in my pocket, and then stuff it in that <laughs> the back <laughs> pocket on there. Uh, but yeah, research, and then throughout. Uh, while while writing too, then I have to do more research. Uh, it's going to take place in Vegas. I've been there twice, but mostly just on the Strip, which isn't the whole city. So I had to research the city too, uh, talk to s some locals, uh, make contact with some locals to get the juicy details because uh, – uh, a lot of stuff you're going to find out about Vegas are from realtors that want you to buy property <laughs> in certain <laughs> parts of the city. So they're not going to say anything bad about it. So I wanted to know which parts, which part of the city is, is bad that you don't want to live in or walk outside at night and that type of thing. And that's how I found, I found that stuff out. It was, uh, um, If you can give a, um, a bit of an estimate, because that's not going to be an exact number, but how much would you say, how much of your research actually goes goes into the book? Maybe 10%, not that much. Because uh, a lot of these documentaries or book, they're, they're like history books, right? And it, it's good to know that stuff, but... What you, what I think you need for a, a role-playing game is material that is gameable, and the material to me that is gameable are the very um, 
tiny details of uh, how does a wise guy um, act? <laughs> uh, yeah. What does he think? Uh, how, how to perform uh, uh, a racket? Um, how to do extortion? How does um, labor union <laughs> racketeering, uh, labor racketeering work? Uh, that type of thing because that's what the players are going to do when they play it they don't care that in 1931 uh, lucky luciano started building the mob i mean it's good to know but um uh, that that is maybe you know a page worth of history on <laughs> on the mob in the book the rest i i wanted hard details on how to play a mobster and uh, that kind of thing. And, and that's where, that's why I think it's only about 10% because most of them either didn't get close enough to the mob to know about these things or they're rats. So you can't really believe what they're saying. Uh, to me, there was only, there's only one guy really that I maybe 99% trust about that sort of thing and it's it's Joe Pistone, FBI agent Joe Pistone, who went undercover uh, for six years as Donnie Brasco uh, from 1976 to 82 uh, with the Bonanno family in New York and he wrote what four books uh, <laughs> I'm almost done with his third book right now and his stuff is really good because he lived the life. He lived the mobster life. He was about to get made, and then he was pulled out because that couldn't happen. But <laughs> so his his stuff, I'd say probably over over half of it is really gameable. But the rest, you learn about certain certain personalities uh, in, in the mob. Uh, Joe Messina. Um, you know, the, the guys from the big movies that you know about and others like Tommy Karate and <laughs> that, that, that you get inspiration for, uh, from to, to make new characters in, in the setting. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, probably 10 percent, not a whole lot. Mm. Yeah, because um, history, all the history documentaries and everything, it gives you an idea about how the life worked how the those people interacted and everything but that's not going to be something you're going to be writing 20 pages about that's something you want to give maybe a bulletin point list or something and because after all the the players are going to be wanting to play some sort of of glamorized romanticized gangster even though the setting is going to be pretty gritty i think it's it's not going to um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not going to to paint it over with with pretty colors, and I'm not even talking about the way that uh, the Godfather did it, where they just omitted a lot of the facts. This is Wise Guys is, as far as I understand it, it's going to be a very brutal and and open portrayal of the mob, right? Well, um, yeah, I think there's a balance between what what uh, well, how the mob is portrayed in movies and the reality that I read from Joe Pistone, um, I think it has to be somewhere in the middle because, uh, well, if you play it totally uh, romanticized, uh, it's it's not going to feel right. It's gonna not going to feel real. But at the same time, if you play it 100% real, it's not going to be interesting because the, the, the most successful mobsters are the ones we've never heard about Yeah, because they actually kept their stuff secret and they flew under the radar and they just made money. The ones we know about, uh, Al Capone, um, uh, from the Gambino family, John Gotti, we all know these guys because they were loud mouths. They liked <laughs> – they like the attention of the, of the media, of the public being loved by by people. And, well, I mean, that didn't get Capone killed, but it got Gotti 
to end his days in prison. So, you know, you, you have to strike a balance in there. Uh, and plus, I gave it a big twist with the whole the Vegas and Tarantino um, themes that I wanted to add in there, which to me made it interesting. As far as make it really gritty and brutal, you can definitely play it that way. Um, all the rules for that are going to be in there and you can make it what you want. But I felt I wanted to add a lot of uh, funny parts, comedy. <laughs> I, I think it's lacking, um, especially with Savage Worlds. There's a lot of great, uh, very serious um, settings for Savage Worlds. But when, when it comes to humor... And playing it lighter, uh, I mean, you've got Saga of the Goblin Horde, which is <laughs> uh, an official setting. It's a great setting, but it, it, it's, you know, fan-made. Uh, and then um, Low Life, after that, ETU has a bit of humor in there. But even the authors say that while it can certainly be played uh, like Scooby-Doo, but they're thinking more... Um, you know, uh, Angel uh, and uh, well, Buffy, that type of thing. So, uh, yeah, there's going to be a balance in there. There's definitely some – because of my research, there's some real facts. I add little sidebars with anecdotes in there uh, to, to make it feel more real. And also, mm. uh, if you want to know about how to perform – uh, extortion or be a, lo a loan shark. Uh, I've got all the information you need in there. But <laughs> at the same time, <laughs> I've got uh, I've got a lot of interesting and kind of out of out there characters. Like uh, well, one in the demo kit, Johnny Banjo. He's a Cajun and he makes bombs and uh, he looks like a total redneck. And if you sneak up to this place. Sometimes you can hear him play the banjo, uh, singing songs. And so it's kind of a weird character. I've got another one. It's the engine. He's an escaped uh, mental patient that likes to dress up as an Indian. And he's a serial killer. So <laughs> there's lots of really wacky out there characters that you wouldn't expect from a mob uh, setting, but in Vegas with the Tarantino twist, I think it makes perfect sense, and it's that bland that that makes it fun. Uh, so far, I've been playtesting this since November, and it's pretty crazy. It's pretty <laughs> out there. <laughs> yeah, I've been in one of those. I've actually been in one of those playtest sessions, and I can attest to that. We had we we had laughs for long stretches of the game. Uh, but when it uh, when it needed to be serious, it absolutely delivered all of that. But that is something we are also going to get into later. So one question that um, came up was, uh, what was the most messed up thing you learned in your research? And I'm going to add to that question, and will it be in the book? <laughs> well... I think as gamers, we're, we're pretty much uh, jaded with the very graphic, violent stuff. So uh, there wasn't really anything in there that aren't in, in the big movies that really shocked me. I mean, you've got um, Tony Spilatro uh, portrayed in Casino by uh, Joe Pesci, <laughs> mm -hmm. who puts a guy's, uh, guy's head in a vice and makes his eyes pop out. Uh, that actually happened. Um, but f to me, the most messed up thing is the realization that at some point between the fifties and mid seventies, uh, the mafia, which actually in the U S is called La Cosa, uh, La Cosa Nostra, which means uh, this thing of ours in, in the U S mafia doesn't exist. It's in Italy, but people still call it the mafia, just like you call, you know, uh, uh, tissue, a Kleenex here, or <laughs> a fridge just instead of refrigerator. So, um, but yeah, the at, at that time they controlled the, basically every aspect 
of life. Everything that you bought was controlled by the mob in some way through labor unions and extortion because from the gas to the food, uh, construction, um, all, all, all of that, the labor, uh, they, they charge people more money and those companies, instead of, uh, you know, just taking that hit would pass on that loss to the customer. So at that point there wasn't anything in New York that, that was getting built, uh, without, um, without the, the mafia, La Cosa Nostra having a hand in it. And to me, that's really like, wow, that, that makes it such a powerful organization. And nobody knew, uh, well, I mean, the cops, the feds knew, uh, but most of them were corrupt too, or paid <laughs> hush money from the, from the mob not to say anything. So to me, that's, that's the most messed up thing. Now, does that have place in the setting? I mean, I, it's described in the book. I, I wrote about it. Um, now, some of the, some of the mob tales definitely take that into account, like, like something greater than you uh, is overseeing everything. But I think it's, it's more uh, up to the GM to make that uh, obvious in, in the games they play. Hmm. So uh, we've already touched on on movies in general and uh, some titles in in uh, detail, but uh, one question that came up is: uh, What is the best gangster movie, and why is it Goodfellas? <laughs> it, it's hard to argue that Goodfellas isn't the greatest one. Uh, it's definitely my top three. My top three are, are Casino, Goodfellas, and Donnie Brasco. Um, so in yeah, no particular uh, order. No, no, because well, of course, I think Casino was a greater influence on uh, on Wise Guys because it takes place in Vegas, uh, and because it is in Vegas, there are things that how the uh, how the mob did things in in New York City, for instance, couldn't have happened in Vegas and vice versa. Um, and Donnie Brasco, because it's a story from Joe Pistone, even if some of the scenes in the movies were changed, where it, there's no way that happened. Uh, like when <laughs> Donnie Brasco cuts up a, a body and kills people that did not happen. That yep. That's actually why he was never, He had to be pulled out of, of his undercover work because he was going to get made. And to get made, you have to kill someone. And if you're an FBI agent, you can't do that. Yep. So uh, there's no way that happened. But, I mean, it looked good in the movie. It was a cool scene, right? So, But, yeah, good fellas, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> probably one of the coolest ones with, with so much style. And, you know, Joe Pesci, De Niro – Leota, it, it's hard to beat. Yeah, it, it's hard to beat De Niro at anything, and De Niro and gangster movies, that's that's a match made. Definitely not in heaven, <laughs> but but somewhere. It's a match in hell somewhere. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's a lot of inspiration coming from gangster movies and, and scripts and documentaries and everything. But um, was there something that was clearly outside the the purview of of gangster influences that heavily changed or, or influenced how some things of Wise Guys turned out? Yeah, uh, two RPGs. Well, one of them, you could argue that it's a bit gangster, but it depends how you play it. Uh, first, Warhammer fantasy roleplay, uh, because... In Warhammer, you don't just play a fighter or a ranger, which means, which doesn't mean much really, right? It, it just tells you what the role in a party that you play, but it doesn't really tell you who you are. So in Warhammer, I mean, you've you've played with me a short campaign, but 
you play you you have an actual job you're a chimney sweeper you're a rat catcher you're an apprentice wizard uh you're you you know you, you do that type of work and to me that adds a lot to the role play experience at the table when you actually have a life outside of adventuring and especially in a setting like wise guys where uh i mean you're in vegas so i mean you live somewhere you mm -hmm. although you live the 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 life of a mobster because it's a, a, a lifestyle you you have a family you <laughs> you have a, a, a cover uh, for your, uh, you know, a job, a real job, probably because you have to explain where all that money is coming from. So to me, that part uh, had a major influence on wise guys where you can be a, uh, a performer, a Las Vegas performer, street performer or on the stage, uh, circus acrobat. Uh, you might be um, a uh, croupier uh, during the day and at night you just you just go and steal so that aspect has made the dynamics the role playing dynamics at the table um, for for my group that I've been play testing with and other groups too as as because we've opened the play test as has really made a big difference the other one Shadow Run, definitely. I remember uh, there was a, a book, I think it was for third edition, called uh, Underworld or something like that. I don't yeah. remember the exact. Yeah. The, so that one was a bunch of different crime syndicate and how they fit into the, the Shadow Run universe. I had that book. I read it. It was one of my favorite. And also, I think it was also for third edition with the the gm screen you got this little booklet with contacts in it and uh, contacts made it into wise guys because one of the most important things uh, in the life of a mobster is the it's who you know <laughs> yeah uh, your connections but it can also be just a one-time guy that uh, i remember doing a job with this guy or this guy's uh, this guy owes me a favor, that type of thing. So, uh, but yeah, Shadowrun is a bit gangsterish because you're <laughs> you're not really a good guy, but you're not totally bad either. You just try to stick it to the man, really. <clears throat> and because uh, a lot of people think or feel, or I mean, it's their right and whatever works for them, but that playing bad guys doesn't work in RPGs. And to me, Shadowrun is probably the best example of what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> you know? Well, technically the way it's spun in Shadowrun, you are the good guys because the corporations are actually the big evil in the world and yada, yada, yada. And yeah, that's all bullshit. So yeah, you are, yeah, you are totally, you're playing, yeah, you're playing the bad guys in a world that, where, where there's very little good guy. And I think the, the notion of you can't play bad guys in pen and paper is mainly by people who have never played games which are tailored to play bad guys if they think you can't play bad guys in in pen and paper they are thinking of groups who played um uh chaotic Psychotic killers yeah chaotic <laughs> evil characters in in D, D or something and people that just came to the table and went on on psychotic killing sprees and just burned down every village and that is not how you play bad bad characters that is not how you play evil characters that is not what those people do they they have an agenda they have a life and you need a framework for that yeah. so um i think from what i've seen from the from the demo kit wise guys does a very good job of of transporting exactly that the knowledge that your character is going to be on the wrong side of the law from our perspective as law-abiding citizens but that is not necessarily how they see it because it's just that is their life that is their way of life so they don't see themselves as as the bad guys they're just seeing no, them as they're businessmen 
Yeah, they're businessmen. They're just trying to make money. They're trying to make money in ways the state doesn't want them to. But, well, that just means they have to be always that one step ahead of law enforcement. Yeah, and you you just mentioned framework, and there is one in Wise Guys, and it's spelled out clearly first with the with the tropes and the themes and then later on in, in the dawn's corner which is kind of the gm's uh, advice section because uh, wh- when you're in the mob whether you're made or not it, it, you you might be just an associate but you, you you can't just go around and kill anybody you, that doesn't agree with you like you would in D and D, right? <laughs> you take the shortest route to uh, to where you're going, and if someone's in your way, you don't try to bargain with that person. You don't try to put him away in jail. You just kill them, and that way they'll never come back to bother you again and make the story more interesting. <laughs> uh, which you can't. Well, you can do it if you want to, but first, uh, well, one one of the rules. Uh, when you're made in the mob is uh, it, a murder needs to be approved by the, by the boss. <laughs> so you can't kill just anybody. Uh, if you do, they're going to kill you. So <laughs> go ahead and kill whoever you want. But the next day or in a couple weeks or maybe a couple months, they'll make it the suspense last a little bit for you, but they're going to kill you. Uh, second of all, the, while there's the law, FBI, uh, and even the local cops, which at the time where the campaign uh, takes place in the 90s, the surveillance technology is really, really good. And the laws uh, against organized crime with the RICO law, uh, racketeering influence and corrupt organization law, in effect, that makes that gives the law a lot of very powerful tools to uh, prosecute while well, in, investigate and prosecute the mobsters. So, and third of all, uh, making all that heat, uh, uh, that exposure uh, really cuts into your profit because the mob relies on flying under the radar to make good money. So, okay, appear in the paper every day and see how much money you can make after that uh yeah you know, how, how, how long you're gonna last how long last, you're going so. to last yeah i I, th- I was about to say there's a mob boss who could t- tell you a story about that if he was still alive oh. yes so you know okay be a murder hobo if you want but and it, it, it it's all up to the gm really how he how um, seriously he wants to take this, how severe he wants to be with, with these themes and uh, these tropes. Uh, but, you know, realistically, if you do that, you're just not going to last. Yeah. So uh, the, the goal of the game isn't to, to kill anybody in your path uh, on your way to the throne, but it's to be smart about it and uh, – yeah, how smart can you be to get to the top, rise to the top? Uh, John Gotti wasn't the smartest guy, and he killed his way up to the top, and uh, it didn't last very long. Hmm. So. so the tropes and themes you are going to provide in the full setting book, those are basically guidelines you can take to, to, to mold your way of play and the way your, your character behaves. Or, or are there actual setting rules maybe spawned by the tropes and and themes or something that helps you along those lines? Well, they're not in the setting rules section, but we just recorded an episode on the Wild Eye where we talked about the goon, where some of the themes and tropes were actual setting rules in the goon. So, uh, no, I mean, I just, that's how the book starts. There's a short introduction and then a list of themes and tropes to help the reader frame the whole uh, setting idea uh, how it works so um, yeah guidelines is, is a good name it, it just gives you a good idea of um, how, you know what you can expect from this setting basically cool so you already mentioned them um, or it 
heat and um, you actually uh, implemented mechanics for that. So yeah, you can go on a killing spree, but it's going to affect you and everyone around you. And that is not just a trope or a theme in Wise Guys. It's go There's going to be an actual mechanic behind that. So why did you go that way? Implement a mechanic for it and not, ju and not just do what me uh, some other books do and say, yeah, if they do this and this, uh, the GM should maybe give them the wanted hindrance or something, which is something in the mechanics. But yeah, how, how did that happen? Well, for, from my experience playing all these years is that, uh, of course, you can do that through GM Fiat. And if you don't like the heat mechanics or just don't want to bother with them, uh, that's fine. It can easily be taken out and it, it, it's going to work just fine. But in some groups, it might feel arbitrary uh, or the GM is the GM is after me. You know, it, it just feels like. Uh, you did something wrong, criminal, uh, sometimes you'll get away with it, sometimes you won't. So I wanted something uh, something that GMs could use because from my experience using those mechanics is that, okay, you want to break the windows of this, uh, this store because <laughs> you want to extort money from this guy. Okay. Well, it's broad daylight and there are people on the street. This seems like heat, two levels of heat. All right. So you do it, you, and then I've got cards that says heat on it, and then I put them on the table. This is what that means. Once I get put a third one on there, the, uh, the cops are coming after you guys. And like you said, it's not just against you it's against the whole crew because it's the uh, known associate clause of the rules which means uh you know you're together so even if maybe they might have nothing against you they're still going to question everybody from the crew and it basically works like wounds or fatigue uh, so it's it i think it's a mechanic that everybody's familiar with uh that they can uh easily improvise uh with so basically with, with that situation where you break the windows so you have witnesses uh, that you need to get rid of or silence so then you go and you use uh, persuasion maybe using hush money and then for every success on there you get rid of one heat level or you can intimidate them ask for their wallet tell them hey i know we where who you are i know where you live if you say anything about this i'm gonna pay your family a visit how about that intimidation mm. every success gets rid of one heat level and we move on it it isn't something that is really intrusive or so far it hasn't been at all uh and but what it does mainly is to is to make the players aware of it and force them to to be discreet in what they do and for that reason alone i so far it works it works really <laughs> well and uh, something else also is uh, one forget about it you had all these little secrets between each uh, each mobsters and it was designed to pit them against each other because they're bad guys they're gonna fight <laughs> against each other right and uh for some people that worked uh, for me it didn't work all that much because players want to get along and they don't yeah. want to do pvp uh so i needed a different mechanic to uh, to create that and this uh, this has worked better for me because the uh, the players are going to police themselves okay Ma manuel we're in the same group and you decide to just go punch this guy in the face now i'm gonna jump in the way and i'm gonna restrain you i'm gonna tell you don't do that you're gonna get us in trouble yeah. you know what i'm saying yeah. so it, it 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 makes the players uh, and their characters police each other but uh, also you know make them fight a little bit against each other so uh that was the whole reason behind it and um like I said, it, it works well, and because it's it's modeled after uh, wounds or fatigue, that type of thing. Because once you get heat levels, then if you try to 
uh, get in touch with your connections. It's harder because they don't want to be associated <laughs> with you. They, yeah. they heard that, you know, the police is looking for you. So they're not going to pick up the phone or when you knock at their door, they're just going to run out the back, yeah. that type of thing. So, uh, and then you, you notice that the cops are at heat, uh, uh, level one of heat the the cops start uh surveilling you so you're going to start no noticing that there's a pair of binoculars from across the street that <laughs> sticks out the window once in a while at level two then they're going to start just probing you a little bit asking a couple questions so i think it, it creates a little bit of tension during the game uh it helps uh, the, the players police each other and it keeps the game running where it doesn't devolve into this giant bloodbath because players just want to kill everybody that doesn't agree with them or that witnessed something. Um, so, yeah, that's basically it. So what, do you what say, did you think of it? Um, I, don't, I don't think in the playtest, I, I think I was in one of the earlier playtests and I don't think the heat mechanic actually affected us that much if at all because i remember the heist and how cool that mechanic worked but i can't remember anything about the heat mechanic so can't speak to that um from from first hand knowledge of of seeing it in action and work but uh from reading what from reading about it in the toolkit um i was like this is something I would like to steal for Savage Shadowrun. The problem well, is... Well, that, that's the thing, too, that with uh, another playtester, that heat can be used for more than just uh, heat from the law. It could be... You might be playing a mediev medieval game and you have to infiltrate a, a certain compound uh the heat could be being detected by the bad guys, basically. Yeah. So it's just it's just a way to create a bit of tension and not be totally arbitrary and say, all right, well, you missed your climbing check. A rock comes loose and then you get swarmed all of a sudden by <laughs> by guards, you know, which for some group, it might it might work for them that way. But I think uh, when you have actual rules around it, it, it helps uh make it more digestible by the players yeah absolutely the problem i saw with uh, actually putting something like that in savage shadowrun would be there's just too many factions and it would result in a lot of bookkeeping on the gm side to always stay up to date so, so because like okay so errors you have a heat level of two then there's local law enforcement where you have a heat level of one you pissed off the yakuza they're about to cut you all into tiny little pieces that's a heat level of three and this which one of those is going to affect you calling that specific connection you're about to call and that's when I realized, yeah, probably not the best idea to do that in a game where you have really that many factions you're going to have to balance against each other. Well, you, you don't always have to track it for that long either. It, it, it could be re relevant for one adventure and then past that, you know, it sort of boils over a little bit and gets into the background, you know. Yeah. It, it's just it's just to create tension and like you mentioned the heist i mean the heist and heat kind of work together although i provide a, an optional way to uh perform the the a heist without using heat so but yeah they kind of work together too cool so uh the heist mechanic um i get I, I guess going into detail would probably make this run for for another two hours or so yeah but just well, give us it's a, a variation yeah it's just a variation of the dramatic task really but instead of being able to because with a dramatic task you might roll you know five raises on the first round and then it's over um so with with the heist instead instead you you draw cards randomly that will determine the, t the type of obstacles that you you'll face during the heist it can be a barrier like a fence uh, guards it can be uh, subterfuge so motion sensors cameras that type of thing and then you have complications which 
the complications, the players can't really prepare for them. They're just going to happen and then they'll have to deal with them. But the rest, uh, it is assumed that you start the heist right in the middle of the action. Uh, you don't have time to prepare. But when you face an obstacle, so it could be a fence. Uh, so instead of, you know, spending sessions after session uh trying to gather information about the place that you're at. Uh, now you're in front of a fence. Uh, the players can just say, I got a wire cutter <laughs> and I just cut it instead of, you know, role playing, going to the store and buying a wire cutter or getting all that f information. Now this is pretty simple, but uh, now imagine there are guards coming uh, now, and, and, and real, real robbers will know the, you know, the patterns, survey, security patterns, the shifts when they switch and that type of thing. So you can just run a, a short flashback scene where you actually gathered that information on the spot and then you can just move on. You make your roll. And the role gets the same penalty as if you were dealing with it now. But you just deal with the obstacles right away and then decide how you actually prepared for it, um, which requires a little uh, mind shift. But the way it, ex it it's explained in the book, I think people will get it. Uh, we've I've ran one heist, took half hour. Another one took an hour because we had, what, seven players so, you know, you, you can run it without the rules if you want. If you're the type of group that wants to spend four sessions planning a heist and two sessions playing it, go ahead. There's nothing <laughs> stopping you. But if you want to do it quick in a fast, fur uh, fast, fun and furious way, in a Savage Rules way, this is basically what this is. And uh, I've received nothing but good feedback on them with all the play tests. So... Uh, still needs a little bit of tweaks, uh, a couple tweaks here and there, but this, that's why the demo kit is out. So people can try it and tell me what doesn't work for them so I can fix it. Cool. So would you say there is a wrong way to play this setting? That was actually a fan question. <laughs> no, um, I know uh, how I like to play it. I know how I like, I like to run it. Uh, but I've seen other play, uh, other people run it differently, and you know it's because the thing also with wise guys it's which you don't get to see a whole lot in the demo kit, uh, but you can probably imagine with the setting rules in there is that it, it's also a a toolkit um, where you can run any any type of uh, criminal crime setting that you want uh, with the same edges, hindrances and setting rules, you, you can just as well run uh, bikers, uh, drug cartel smugglers, um, post-apocalyptic uh, syndicate or black market type of guy. Uh, I've got a writer he just completed his submission where you get a whole primer and I'm not talking a paragraph or a page or two pages. I'm talking seven to 10 pages on uh, the Sicilian mafia. Uh, there's the Yakuza in there, uh, Chinese triad, uh, Russian bratva, Mexican drug cartel and the bikers. And cool. they're all in there, all the information on how they, um, how they were created how they operate, what their structure is, and then uh, their lingo, that type of thing. So we're talking seven, seven to ten pages just of information, and then yeah. I'm working on doing on each of them. So yeah. we're, we're talking, you know, 50, 60 pages, and then I'm going to add uh, all their, their uh, profiles. So you're going to have probably between five to – all the way to close to 20 for the drug cartel, yeah. of just stat blocks. So we're talking over 100 stat blocks in wise guys, ranging from all these crime syndicates, normal people, law enforcement, 
uh, and the wise guys too. So th this is why it's a toolkit as well, a modern crime uh, toolkit. Cool. So that is one fan setting I finally don't have to think about writing anymore because I can finally get to play Sons of Anarchy and all of these is the full wise guys release. So. Yes. Oh yeah, definitely. I've got uh, I've got the Nomad Edge. Uh, I've got the combat. What's it called? Combat. Uh, by a combat biker or something like that, mm -hmm. where you you can drive your bike and shoot at the same time with no penalty. So th there's a bunch of edges. That, that can be used for that. Same with hindrances and, of course, the setting rules. So, we, so um, what you also uh, wrote about in the demo kit means there are going to be adventures, of course, an adventure generator, and there's going to be a PPC. So I'm guessing since the demo kit and Wise Guys is uh, located in the Las Vegas of the early to mid 90s, uh, the PPC, that's going to be in that Vegas? Yeah. Uh, it, it took me a while to find a good idea for uh, plot point campaign because being uh, bad guys, um, a lot of power point, uh, plot point campaign rely on certain individuals to still be alive for it to function. And it's something that doesn't really work well when you play a bad guy where <laughs> they can get rid of anybody at any moment. Uh, but yeah, I started uh, writing it and two plot point episodes in right now. Basically, it, it's in Vegas and there's a mob boss that was uh, that some people tried to kill uh, seven years ago, but it didn't work out. Uh, instead, he ended up in a coma for seven years. Uh, the feds took him under their protection because they had questions uh, for him. But now the plot point campaign begins where that guy comes out of the coma mm -hmm. and escapes from federal custody. And now he's, he's pretty pissed off. So <laughs> things are going to happen. And that's oh, okay. basically the, the players are in the middle of that and they have to deal with it because they're somehow involved and yeah that's that's what it is cool oh yeah that sounds like uh vegas isn't going to be the same when when the dust settles on that one so uh regarding players the archetypes you provide in the demo kit there's uh actually only a single made man in there and everyone else are uh, are, are associates so um is there an ideal mix for a group or could you just play in an all out all associates game and still be able to run the PPC, for example? Oh, yeah. Any, any mix. I mean, uh, uh, being a wise guy, uh, it's an edge. It's a gangster edge, which I'm still trying to tune, but it gives you certain advantages that uh, associates don't get. But it also makes you more liable for what happens with the group because we, we we started with basically uh, 80 percent of the the uh, the pregens in the campaign the, the play tests we're running and the guy playing the the only main man at some point decided that he wanted to play a different character because he, he didn't want to be the straight guy, <laughs> the guy that had to answer for all the troubles that the others uh, created. Uh, <laughs> oh, man. So, uh, it, yeah, it, you could have any mix, really, because, uh, I mean, if there's no main man in the, in the group, it just becomes that your supervisor the one telling you what to do is just a regular wise guy instead of being a capo regime uh captain in the mob so and you could play an all made made guy cast if you wanted to which would <laughs> make it really interesting as well so but the reason i the reason there's only one and the ratio well through research, that's another thing I found out is that, uh, well, according to the FBI, uh, only one out of 10 uh, 
criminal working for the mob is actually a made man. Mm. The rest are all associates. Um, and uh, being an RPG, I want female characters to be in, interested in that game. I want female players to be interested in that game. And all the genders in between, which, you know, it's part of our reality today. So um, that was that was my way to make this uh, accessible to everybody because – First, I didn't want to change the fact that uh, to be part of the mob, you, your father has to be uh, of Italian descent, origin, heritage, or whatever. And that won't change. Uh, that's still like that. They're still sexist. They're still macho and all that. Uh, but they still employ people that aren't in the mob. Uh, they employed Jews. I mean, Ma- Mayor Lansky, Bugsy Siegel. Uh, all these guys that work for the mobs, they were Jewish and they were still, uh, you know, they were still really chummy with these guys. Uh, uh, Pernell, uh, Pernell in, in uh, Goodfellas, the one that was driving the truck, mm-hmm. uh, Samuel L. Jackson was black. So it doesn't really matter. That's one of the tropes where uh, equal opportunity evil. <laughs> <laughs> They don't care, you know. They, they, if you if you can earn money for them, they don't care if you you're gay, you're black, you Chinese uh, woman. Uh, they don't care. But to be a made guy, uh, that's different. And I thought that was important. Just as you know, you don't want to play in a setting where Nazis are black guys. You know, it doesn't make sense, right? So. Yeah, so keep to the to some of the really hardcore core uh, core um, definitions of it, but open up everything else for it to be accessible. Yeah, I can I can see the the reasoning behind that, and I think I think it will work. I, from with um, with our group uh, with the female characters, they work perfectly. It integrated well into it. It didn't feel out of place in any way. So, yeah, I say from what I've seen so far, well done. Yeah, thank you. No, it works well. I mean, right now we've got uh, <clears throat> we've got a, a London gangster. We've got uh, uh, well Linda from the pregens, but Gary's creating another character. We've got a former boxer in there. Um, we've got little Debbie from the pregens as well. Uh, Lucian, but now the guy that played this uh, Tommy Blue decided to make another character, and now he's a He's a midget, and he's a porn actor, and okay. also a luchador by night. <laughs> and, oh my god, that is awesome! And he's a lot of fun, and uh, you know all these characters together create such unique role playing uh, scenes that you can't you can't find that anywhere else in any other RPGs that I know. So it, uh, it, that's bottom line. <laughs> So will you be providing uh, archetypes for the Stooges? If you don't know what I'm talking about, there's going to be a video in the description below this video. Uh, yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> I, I didn't look into that. Uh, there's just so many things right now. Maybe maybe at some point. Uh, you, n- you never know. <laughs> cool. So there are some other things you are only hinting at in the demo kit that is bonds redeeming quality and origins so are those more guidelines or are those actually mechanics that are going to be in there well uh, redeem, uh, those are all part of the character creations origins are basically like races hmm. i mean uh, obviously we play in, it's in the real world it's in vegas so you're going to play a human you're not going to play you know a werewolf or <laughs> an alien so but i i wanted to provide a bit more uh options for character creation so i created origins so you you have the country bumpkin you have the war veteran you get the silver spoon you've got the the street kid uh there's like five of them and then you have archetypes but treated the same way as in the um the deluxe rule the core rules where you have a set of archetypes in there they're like Mm -hmm. 
80% built. So you, you, you start with a profile and then you have, you know, anywhere from two to seven skill points to distribute yourself. You pick your own edges and hindrances. And then I provide a little bit of guidance for advancement, what that type of character would probably want to go for, uh, which is just my little addition to how Pinnacle does it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you can you can remove one of the starting edges and pick a different origin if you wanted to, to give even more um, uh, options, uh, even more differences from character to another. I've got 24 archetypes right now, starting archetypes, where yeah. you could be playing in about two minutes. You know, you pick an archetype uh, if you want to, Pick a different origin, or you can just do it the whole the old way, like everybody knows how to do it. While the Savage Worlds veterans really do yeah. it, I just you you peruse the edges and hindrances section, and you start from scratch. You can do that if you want to, but I want something where um, you know beginners or people not really familiar with Savage Worlds could just go in and pick them. So. Uh, Basically, that's what origins are. Redeeming qualities. We talked about playing bad guys, right? And yeah. now for some people, it doesn't work. Well, if you're familiar with uh, with mob uh, mob movies, usually these guys are real family man, right? Uh, I mean, they go home and they'll cook breakfast for their family. They'll take their daughter to ballet classes and that type of thing. These are their redeeming qualities. So that this is basically, yes, it is a guideline during character creation. It is encouraged that the players pick one for their characters through their hindrances, which is mm -hmm. the best way to simulate that. So, yeah. so as to make them uh, more appealing to the audience. And when you're playing, you're also the audience. So uh, it makes it more interesting and it, it adds something to it. Uh, the bonds... I'm actually thinking about ditching them because they don't come into play enough. <laughs> but it's just uh, – it, it's basically when you create your character, you go around the table and you pick one person that's your your partner, that's someone that you trust. And with that character, you can, uh, you can spend your bennies with that character. He can't spend his bennies with you, but mm -hmm. you can – give him bennies and then you have one other around the table uh, he's your adversary and with when that person decides to turn on you and attack you you can't soak damage from that Whoa. character and i did that at first to create more uh, party dynamics more interesting mm -hmm. fighting but it turns out that it doesn't really come up all that often. So it's basically a good idea that doesn't really work in practice. But I'm I'm trying to think of different ways to make that work. Cool. Um, uh, I'm very interested to see where that ends up in, in the finished uh, product. And speaking of the finished product, so you've mentioned all throughout this interview that you're still in the process of coming up with more ideas, of writing stuff. The PPC is only two um, plot points in at the moment so uh, is there even a rough timeline on, on when it's going to be published and is it uh, is it going to be a Kickstarter or how are you going to tackle that yeah Kickstarter to raise money for the artwork and editing I want some serious editing for this and serious editing costs so yeah. um, timeline uh, here's one thing this is this will be my first kickstarter and because of that one i've studied the kickstarters too that was part of my research and what i like about kickstarter campaigns is when the product is already done <laughs> they just need money to complete it so that's why it's taking uh, so long because when when it's going up on Kickstarter, I'll be 95% completed mm. with the book because some of the, the stretch goals that I want to add onto that is that people are going to be characters in the setting. So 
that part obviously I can't complete until these uh-huh. people uh, have pledged. But the rest, that the draft is going to be completed. Uh, right now, I'm sitting at almost 200 pages. Um, wow. So I mean, Holy I crap. could have went on Kickstarter last year with it and then tell people that it would take a year to complete, and now I'd be struggling to get it done, and people would get angry. And I don't want that to happen. Yeah. When we go on Kickstarter, it, it's because we're just going to be waiting on the artwork, the editing, and the layout. The, the writing is going to be done. Now, I, I'm, I'm, I feel I'm really close to getting this done. I still have a little bit of research to do about procedures, legal procedures on when you get arrested, when you go to court. Uh you know, how many years do you get from a robbery, arm robbery, that type of thing where I'm going to add that. Then I've got the uh, plot point campaign to finish. Uh, but the main reason why we're holding on to this right now is because we're waiting on Savage Black. Yeah, that's that that's basically understand. what it is. Uh, I mean, we've all seen <laughs> what they're working on and we have a really good idea of what they're going to come up with. But until... Until I can hold it in my hands and say these are the changes they've actually made and yeah. I want my book to be compatible with this, no. I So uh, granted, I added the perform skill and wise guys because mm-hmm. you're in Vegas, performers and all that, it makes sense. Yeah. And then when I learned <laughs> that they were actually going to make – well, at least in in uh, Flash Gordon. In Flash Gordon, it's in there, so the transition is should be fairly smooth. It, it's actually gonna, I'm gonna have to remove more stuff than I'm gonna have to add because uh, probably a good four or five skills are about doing tricks and test of mm-hmm. wills differently. And now the way they're they're doing it in Flash Gordon. Uh, they're not going to be needed anymore. So. <laughs> yeah, and then, yeah, once that is done, probably a good six months that we're giving ourselves, and it's probably going to take a lot less than that, but we don't want people to uh, come throw rocks at us because it's not <laughs> ready. Because it's my, it's yeah. going to be my first, and I, I want to do it right, and I want to deliver when I say I'm going to deliver. And yeah. So, yeah, first it's going to be fully written, except the parts where I'm going to add you to the book. And then uh, yeah. we're going to be waiting on the artwork. So you do realize you've just really put me in a tough spot because now it's it's basically a given that Manny Sambino has to be in that book, right? You do understand he, that. <laughs> he already is, actually. It's, he's one of the main it? villains in the book, yeah. You... I... Wow. Well, I'm... I'm kind of spe- <laughs> for everybody not understanding what we're talking about. Manny Sambino <laughs> was a joke between us. It's it's an a, a, a pseudo Italian version of my full name. Uh, Eric yeah. came up with and uh, wow! So I just learned live on on camera that I'm I'm a I am I am a main villain in in, in Wise Guy. Wow, yeah, I'm, I mean I'm he's. Yeah, no, but it, it just came together for me. I, I, I kept thinking, you know, while well, you're, you're a sharp dressed guy and you, you look European, uh, you could easily look like an Italian. So why not? And I mean, you're already in the demo kit, right? You're in the adventure Fugazi. You're in there. So uh, you're just going to be probably a bigger part of the of the setting. You're part of the power, uh, plot point campaign as well, so oh, there you go. You. <laughs> You're welcome. So now I have to come up with another NPC <laughs> to get in there. <laughs> Damn it! Ah, oh, more thinking for me to do, but that's okay. That's something. Like... Okay, so basically, yeah. Um, when it's 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 done, when it's done, and it's going to be done at the earliest if Savage Black is done. So, yeah, well, that gives us something to. Um, yeah, I mean, Savage Black's supposed to be by the end of the year. Um, I, I mean, I imagine I'm maybe two or three months away from finishing my draft. Uh, if if 
Savage Black only comes by the end of the year, I'm still going to be uh, play testing this or making sure it gets play tested. And then Black comes out and I'm going to make the adjustments and then uh, we're going to start planning the campaign. So, uh, yeah, it's dependent on Black. Cool. All right. So that was a lot about wise guys and we actually got uh got some questions in regarding regarding you and not the project so uh terry hansen would like to know uh all of your wild day co-hosts have a second podcast uh, so when are you starting your solo project well i actually i think it flew under the radar quite a bit but uh, a couple months ago i started with a series on YouTube, a wise guys video diary, uh, where I talk about the process of how I, how I created this, how I wrote it, the struggles, and, but it's, it's a bit more than that. It's like a, uh, well, then help. I try to help people that maybe are creating their own settings so I'm sharing my own struggles, how I did it to give them ideas uh, in, in more bro uh, broader uh, broader terms where they can, uh, you know, like last episode, add edges and hindrances. But uh, uh, that's not really a podcast. I'd like to have another one. Uh, I have really good ideas on another one. Uh, but the thing is, you know, I got my day job. Uh, I need to sleep. Uh, I've got the Wild Eye podcast that takes a good five to ten hours a week uh, from me. And now I've been writing this. And I also like to game, right? <laughs> I like to yeah. play RPGs. And uh, out of all these activities, I had to cut back on some of them just to be able to write this. And turns out that my gaming time, uh, I had to cut back a lot on that. So uh, sorry, Terry, I'd love to. But I just don't have the time right now. <laughs> well, and then we had another question from Harrison Hunt. He would like you to comment on his cat. Oh, that cat looks like uh, white trailer trash to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> there okay. you go. Th there you go, Harrison. That's... Eric's official comment on on your cat. <laughs> well, I guess we've we've covered a lot, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'll be very happy to have you back here once the the full product is out to talk about everything we didn't cover here because maybe it didn't it, it doesn't even exist yet and will be in the finished product. So, thank you very much for for being here, Eric. It was uh, a pleasure having you. Yeah, I'd love to come back and. Uh... It was great. Usually, uh, I'm the one asking questions, so it's good to. It's fun to be interviewed. It's very flattering, and for that, uh, yeah, I thank you. <laughs> you are welcome. Well, um, thank everyone who was watching, who is watching. If you're hearing this, obviously you are still watching. Uh, this show is part of the Nerds International Network. You can find us on Google Plus, Google Plus, yeah, Google Plus at uh, the Nerds International community. Come drop by, hang out with us, have a laugh at Harrison's expense. And um, well, that, thank you. And um, I, we will see you in the next one. Stay savage, everyone. <laughs>